Good morning and happy Sabbath to everyone. Uh, I hope everyone can see me here okay. I've got an earpiece in today so that hopefully those on Zoom can uh, hear me clearly. Uh, Cheryl is, of course, here helping with uh, the technology. And uh, I have to be honest, I've been praying for the Holy Spirit, but I've also been praying for help with this technology. You know, it's kind of like the Bible. The more time I spend with this technology, the more I realize I don't know. It's, uh, it's, it's turned out to be a real challenge for me. But I uh, just praise God that we can get together here today um, through uh, media. And I'm just asking and praying that you'll be praying this weekend, this day, this Sabbath, right now that the Holy Spirit will come and be with us and that we can be blessed uh, as we worship uh, here together today. Um, just want to thank those of you who are continuing to um, remember the church with your tithes and offerings. Uh, I did send out an email at least uh, to the Juno Church um, reminding them of where you can send that and how you can do that. We still have to make the bills at church. Uh, um, still, heat has to be paid and bills have to be paid. So I, I hope and pray that you'll continue to remember uh, your your churches um, during this this difficult time. We uh, we have a great God who continues to take care of our needs, and so we praise praise Him for that. Uh, here it is. The this Sabbath, we're going to actually step away from the study on the Holy Spirit just a moment. I'm sure as most pastors, uh, this being the Resurrection Weekend, uh, want to focus and spend a little time. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing to me when I realize that uh, this Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. And a, a little over 2,000 years ago, Jesus, the ruler of the universe, came and went through an experience that I want to spend a little bit of time talking to you about this morning. In fact, just before Calvary, Jesus was speaking to his disciples and speaking to us in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. If you have your Bible or you have your device with you, I encourage you to turn to John Chapter 14 and verse 3. We're going to be looking at John 14 and uh, 15 here in the next few moments. But it tells us in John 14, beginning in verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And as we watch Jesus and his disciples, we see him try to comfort his men on the announcement that he's going away and that they can't follow him now. And we follow them as they go down among the stone-paved streets of Jerusalem. And we don't have any trouble following them now, for the Passover moon is full. And so they slip along the streets from shadow to shadow, and it's quite easy to keep track of them. We see them pass out the eastern gate, and we listen as they bid good night to the gatekeeper. We watch them as they pass quickly to the Kidron Brook below. Carefully, they pick their way across the Kidron, stone by stone, because there's no bridge there at this time. And they're very careful not to let their garments get wet, especially at this time, because the blood is flowing from the main altar down into the great pipes that are just dumping into the Kidron, and it would stain their garments. In fact, during this seven days of Passover, from sunrise to sunset, over 626,000 lambs were slaughtered. And that's a lot of blood to run down into the Kidron. 
We watch them as they begin to ascend the Mount of Olives. We watch as the path moves along in the moonlight and comes beside a great stone wall. And Jesus stops and he gathers the 11 men around him and he picks up the vine that has escaped from the trellis on the other side of the wall. And there he delivers that beautiful discourse that we find in John chapter 15. I'd like to read the first five verses of John chapter 15. Uh, John 15. Again, if you have your Bible or your device handy there. It says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for with me you can do nothing. Jesus now, we see him lay the vine back down on the wall and he continues on to the fork in the road. Now before I move on in this sermon, I realize that I didn't stop to pray. You know, I don't think we should ever open God's word and try to understand and ask for the Holy, without asking for the gift of the Holy Spirit. So I would like to stop right now and uh, let's pray. Oh Lord, uh, Amazing that I get so caught up in this that I forget to come to you, Lord. You're our strength and our courage and our God, our friend and our help. And you spit, you send us your, your beautiful and wonderful Holy Spirit. And so we stop now asking you to come and bless, Lord, to be with this technology, which I don't have a clue how any of it works, but uh, you, you are here. We just ask and pray that you will somehow bring all this together and help it to work. Help people to be able to hear and see and understand. And Lord, more than anything, we just need the presence of your Holy Spirit to come and lead us as we take a look at the life of Jesus in this resurrection weekend, this Calvary weekend. As we see what you did for us, we're asking for you to come and be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Now again, we see Jesus lay down the vine on the wall and he continues to this fork, that fork in the road. Now, the road off to the right goes down the mountain and down into Bethany where Jesus can find peace and safety and security that night. But the, the path to the left goes off into the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus, he pauses in the pathway. He lingers there, seemingly trying to make a decision where he'll spend the night. And the disciples are not aware that Jesus knows that if, if he goes to the right, if he goes over the mountain, the priest will not find him that night. But if he turns to the left, they will come and they will find him. And if you're standing in the shadows and, and you're close enough to hear, you would hear Jesus sigh deeply and almost with, with a, a breath, breath of resignation, he turns to the left. And as he begins to walk along the path into the garden, he moves very slowly. The spring and the bounce that's usually in his step, it now disappears. He, he seems very reluctant to go in. In fact, the, the disciples who are watching him from behind, they notice that he's just, just barely dragging his feet. And, and suddenly he does something that's very uncommon for him. He trips and, and stumbles, and he doesn't even seem to have the strength to recover. And two of the disciples do rush up. They rush forward to, to try to keep him from falling. 
And as they look at him, they see an expression on his face that they've never seen before, and they're deeply puzzled. They let him go as he continues to walk along very slowly. And now, again, he trips, and this time, when he trips, he seems so weak and so tired that he actually groans as he, he tries to but, uh, catch his balance and keep from falling. And two of the disciples, they now do grab him and support him and are deeply concerned that they get him into the garden quickly so that he can find rest for the night. And as they now come into the garden, he, he turns to the eight of them. And he says, please, please, I, I'd like you to stay here and to watch and pray. And now turning to the three that had been with him on the Mount of Transfiguration, the three that had seen him in his glory, he now asked them to go farther into the garden that they might see him in his moments of deepest humiliation but even they're not allowed to go the whole way. And finally, he turns to them and says, please stay here, stay and watch and pray with me. And they kneel down on the ground. And he goes, it says, another stone's throw from them under the olive trees. And, and Jesus falls on the ground and he begins to pray. And this was not the, the lovely, beautiful scene with, with Jesus kneeling with a, a long, beautiful robe flowing back behind him with moonlight fly, uh, shedding down from heaven upon him. It wasn't that way at all. For Jesus Christ has now literally walked into hell for you and me. And let me explain, because I think we need to explain because we have a whole history of thousands, literally hundreds of thousands of martyrs who have died through the centuries. And they have gone to their grave with songs on their breath and prayers of praise that have, have coming out of their mouths as the flames lick around their feet. And yet we don't see Jesus going to his death this way. We see Jesus very reluctant to go into the garden. We see him dragging his feet and hesitating, lingering outside, not wanting to go in. And I think we must ask ourselves legitimately the question, is our Lord less of a man than those that died for him later on? I mean, why do they go so willingly to their death and Jesus so reluctantly? And the answer to it is this. As the martyrs go to their graves and they're burned at the stake and they're, they're eaten by the lions, they know that the very next instant after death they will awaken. And they know that they're, they're going to be resurrected to, to see Jesus in all his glory. And sometimes I, I think the martyrs can hardly wait for the lions to do their work. But you see, Jesus now goes to his death. And he's not going to that kind of death. For Jesus is now paying the second death. He now must pay the price for our sins. And the price of sin is not a temporary sleep death that all of us fall into. Jesus now becomes a substitute for you and my guilt and sins. And in order to do this, Jesus must now experience the mental agony that we are supposed to experience at the end of the millennium, at the end of the thousand years. I mean, after we've been resurrected and we gathered around the holy city. You see, at the end of the thousand years, we've been with Jesus, now rejoicing with him. And on earth, Satan has been sitting and he has been waiting for what he thinks is a second chance. Now, sometimes, sometimes for some reason, I think we picture Satan just sitting around during those thousand years and twiddling his thumbs with nothing to do. But I want to tell you something. He has read his Bible also, and he knows 
that there will be a time when the earth will be repopulated and he's going to spend that thousand years planning and scheming and his own ego is big enough to believe that he is going to be able to come up with some grand solution that he can rewrite the last pages of scripture. And after we've been with Jesus for a thousand years, and we all have an opportunity to decide and to be satisfied that God is right, we will follow Jesus as we descend down to this earth. And as we move with Jesus across the broken surface of the earth, and all of the billions of wicked of the wicked from the time of Adam are, are, are resurrected. And we see them come up in the same horrible, decrepit age, debauched, mutilated condition in, in which they went into the grave. And I want to tell you how horrible it must be to know this truth that we know and we understand this morning. And to wake up and see Jesus walking with 16 feet tall, beautiful, handsome saints following him in this beautiful terrain. And we will look at ourselves and come to this, this horrible realization that we have come up in the wrong resurrection. I mean, how, how horrible. And we watch as the billions come up around us and Jesus will take his beautiful train of, of saved ones and, and they will look up and, and the heavenly city will descend for all to see. And as it now rests on the earth, we all now follow him into the city. And the Bible tells us that Satan will have a little while. Now, we have no idea what that means, a little while. I mean, any amount of time is a little while in relation to eternity. But for a little while, he has them and he begins to, to marshal them all together. And I'm sure he comes with all of the great nuclear weapons and everything else that he has in his arsenal. And he gathers them around the heavenly city and he says, hey, look, look, people, listen, there is a tree in there that we can eat from. And if we eat from this tree, we will live forever and we can take it. We can get that tree and they marshal around the city. And all of a sudden, they're stopped because all of the saints began to come and line themselves along the great city wall. And all of the saints, they, they look up above the city and there takes place the coronation of Jesus Christ as King of Kings. And oh, oh, how Satan writhes as he sees us. He despises Jesus so. And after the coronation is over, a great motion picture instant replay of the history of the earth now appears in the sky for all to see. And, and now we, along with the wicked, we watch as we see beautiful Eve leaving resting Adam. And as, as she walks through the garden, we see her as she comes closer and closer to the tree of knowledge and good and evil. And, and I can almost hear the saints standing on the wall, and even though it's just a replay, it's so real that they cry out, Oh, Eve, please, don't do it. But she does, and we see her reach out and, and take the fruit. We see her coming back with the fruit and awakening tall, handsome Adam who was not deceived, but he deliberately sinned, reach out and take that, that fruit. We'll watch Jesus come and throw his arms around them and weep with them. And we see strong Adam kneel on the ground and pull that, that bloody little lamb against his chest as he weeps. We'll see courageous Noah standing and preaching and our hearts are thrilled as we watch 
Moses come to the Red Sea. And our hearts will, will thrill as we see him stand before the people and say, See the salvation of the Lord, the power of the Lord today. You will see the Egyptians no more. We'll see him turn, and I'll tell you, it'll be better than Cecil B. Mills ever did on film as we see the Red Sea part for the children of Israel. And our hearts will thrill as we come into a little stable in the back of Bethlehem. And we watch Jesus, Jesus, the King of Kings, come into the world. And our hearts are thrilled for many reasons because, you see, we, we have over-glorified the Christmas scene, the manger and all. And we make this beautiful little, these beautiful little scenes at Christmas time with nice white sheep and smiling cows and it, it's so pretty. Listen, it, it wasn't that way at all. It was a filthy little hole behind some inn with people's cows and, and piles of manure and maggots in the manure and, and flies. It was awful. Listen, Satan, even though he heard the angels sing to the shepherds when Jesus was born in such filthy, lowly conditions, Satan stood back and he was so totally amazed that Jesus would humiliate himself so. Satan actually doubted whether or not this was really Jesus. I mean, it was so out of character for Satan to understand that God would, would humiliate himself so. We'll watch as our Lord, as he, he climbs that hill to Calvary. And you know, I have a feeling at this point we'll, we'll cover our eyes for for after we've been with Jesus for a thousand years now, and we know and we love him so, I mean, how could we watch what is about to take place? I, I don't think we can. And every eye will see a complete rerun of this world, and as they, they come to that section of their life, they'll have a special insert, and we'll see how the Holy Spirit comes and wooed them. And they'll see how they deliberately chose to, to push away the Holy Spirit from their lives. And the whole purpose of this long replay is that every human being that is lost will realize that he is lost. Not because some, some arbitrary judge off in the universe on a throne somewhere decreed it so, no, but he is lost because he chooses to be lost. He exchanged eternity for 15 minutes of passion off in the bushes somewhere. Every individual will bow and confess that God is fair. And at this point, even though we're, we're in heaven, I think we'll cry. I think the tears will be wiped away as the new earth is created. And how could we stand? How could we possibly stand there at the top of the wall and look down at these people that we've loved and we've labored with and realize that they are now about to die forever from which there is, is no hope of re resurrection ever. I mean, it's all over, and I'll tell you, as they stand down there, and they look up at heaven, and they realize that they could, could have had this for free. I mean, all they had to do was just make the choice and say, oh God, come and live in my life. And Jesus would have given that to them. I'll tell you, that's hell. I mean, the fire that comes down later and burns them up, that's not punishment for sin. That's a blessing. That finally puts them out of the, the mental torture of knowing that they can never have this beautiful heaven that they're seeing. That, that they can't have it because th th they actually chose not to have it. I mean, the punishment for sin cannot be fire, for Jesus never burned. And Jesus did pay the price for our sins. Because you see what happens as Jesus comes in 
to the Garden of Gethsemane. And why Jesus is so reluctant to do so is that as he now turns to the left and he heads down that path, the Heavenly Father begins to separate himself from Jesus. For the first time in 33 years, Jesus is now walking on his own human power. I mean, he's always been in connection with the Father, but Jesus now takes upon himself the burden and the guilt of all of our sins and transgressions. And he must bear that. And he must now mentally experience standing down at the bottom of the wall, knowing what heaven is like, and knowing that he is never going to be resurrected again. For you see, we're told that as Jesus comes into the garden, as he takes upon himself our sins, and as the Heavenly Father separates himself from him, Jesus cannot see through the portholes of the grave. Jesus is now not facing a decision for us uh, to die for us until the great resurrection on Sunday morning. But Jesus is now facing an eternal decision whether or not to die for us forever and ever and ever, never to be resurrected. And as Jesus goes into that garden and he falls prostrate on the ground and he says, Father, let this cup pass from me if there's any other way to save mankind. That cup that he's talking about is the cup of eternal death. And Satan, he now comes in with all the forces of hell itself. And they crowded him and pressed him down to the ground. And Satan whispers into his ear, don't you understand? Don't you understand what you're doing? I mean, God threw me out of heaven because I sinned. And I can never go back. Do you understand that if you take on the sins of all these, these billions of people, that you will never be accepted in your father's sight again? You can't go back to heaven. And Jesus believed this because he's separated from the Father. He has no hope of the resurrection. Now some of you are saying, well, Brad, Jesus told the disciples that he was going to be killed and resurrected again on Sunday morning. The Pharisees came to him and he said to them, you'll tear down this temple and in three days I'll raise it up again. Brad, Jesus knew that he was going to rise again. And that's true. When he was in connection with the Father, when his Father walked with him and lived with him and breathed with him, but now as he, he goes into the garden, he must do this thing alone without any comfort from the Father because those that are dying at the end of the millennium will not be comforted by the Father. He must go through that same exact mental excruciating experience so that he can be our savior he must be our substitute and take our place down there at the bottom of the wall i mean it's no wonder that that on the cross jesus cries out eli eli lama shabashinai my god my god why have you forsaken me his father had forsaken him he had to. I mean, it's the only way that, that Jesus could pay the eternal price and be our substitute. Now listen, I really believe that if you ask me to die this morning so that every one of you listening here this morning could be saved, I really believe I would do that if you assured me that I was going to be resurrected again on Sunday morning. Because you see, I'm going to die tonight anyway, and I'm going to sleep, and, it, and it's a death. And I get a, a few extra hours of sleep, it might be kind of nice. But you come to me today, and you say, listen, Brad, if you will die this morning and never be resurrected again, all of the people listening will be saved. If you die this morning never again, 
to see your wife. Never again to have your grandkids come running across the room and throw their arms around your neck and say, I love you, Grandpa. But to slip now, today, into eternal nothingness, you are, you are asking me a completely different question. You see, a temporary sleep till Sunday morning is not the price for sin. And if it were, every person who has ever died has, has paid the price for sin and we don't see, we don't need Jesus. But that's obviously not the case. You see, the price for sin is going to your death without the hope of, of ever living again. And this is what Jesus did for us on the cross. With We have to, we must understand this. Jesus, he gives up and sacrifices, the adoration of the angels, the thrill of being able to sit on the throne beside his father. Jesus is willing to give up all of that forever and ever and ever so that you and I might be able to take his place. I tell you, that is a very heavy thought. I mean, why would the one that is so powerful that and he could speak worlds into, into existence with just a word. Why is he willing to give up his own eternal existence so that we might live forever? Honestly, friends, I don't, I don't understand that, but I sure do accept it. And my heart sure does over, overflow and just thrill with it. You know, even, even as I speak to you this morning, I, I'm frustrated and I'm afraid that, that, that with a, the lack of, of, of communication skills, verbal communication skills, or the, the lack of technical skills, or the way I'm dressed, it might turn you off and so that you're not listening and you're not understanding this message. Because this is important. I mean, we cannot understand what Jesus did for us there in Gethsemane until we begin to understand this point. The Garden of Gethsemane is not a, a lovely place with olive trees and, and beautiful moonlight. The Garden of Gethsemane is hell. Jesus Christ is so reluctant to go into the garden because like any thinking human being, he's reluctant to walk into hell. I tell you, as he stood there in, in that fork in the path and he looked toward Bethany and he looked toward Gethsemane, Bethany looked pretty good that night. For would anyone turn and deliberately walk into an experience like this? No one except our Jesus. Friends, I tell you, I... I I love him so much this morning. Don't you just love him? I'll tell you, if he isn't the most important thing to us, the most important person in our lives, we need to use this day. We have to use this day, this resurrection weekend, and pick up our Bibles to look again at this, this unbelievable sacrifice. I tell you, we must not let this great price be paid for us that was paid for us to be, to be paid in vain. We must not. We cannot. Friends, let's pray. Oh Lord, as we close this service, we want to see clearly. We want to understand, Lord, just to, to get at least a glimpse of what Jesus has done for us. Oh, Father, please send your Holy Spirit and enlighten our minds and help us to see and understand and know. Oh, Lord, you're, you're such an amazing God. You were willing to make such a sacrifice for us. We want to say thank you and we love you. Lord, on this, this Resurrection Sunday, we just... We give you our lives. We give you our lives on this Sabbath today. We ask you to come and fill us and let us see and let us know. Let us not have this great sacrifice made for us be in vain. Oh Lord, we love you. We praise you. We give you our lives. In Jesus' name we pray.
Thank you, guys. Have a wonderful Sabbath together. Oh, and uh, I have to say hi to Eamon and Zaren and Yaya and Serafina, Des and Ryan while we're there. They wanted me. Those are my grandkids, and they wanted me to say hi to them today. I love you guys. Have a wonderful Sabbath, and praise God.